Actually, we, we have, you know, we have until 1.20, so it's 1.10 and we've got 10 minutes. I, I just want to re remember that we have these three questions that we're supposed to answer, and our scribe is diligently um, going to pay attention you know, to, to what folks have, have to say. There's a couple of folks who haven't spoken who, um, maybe if you want to, well, I don't know, I don't know what you're going to say, Laurie, and, and, and uh, maybe a couple other people who haven't spoken, but if you can try to frame it within these three questions, that would be really useful. But, well, I, I can't think that way, but I, I will just quickly throw out a, a, a concept that keeps coming to my mind, which I'll call pragmatism. Um, I'm on the ground working with the Boston Recycling Cooperative, so, so we're in, the, in that pragmatic level of the work, which is taking the macro to the micro. And, and I would put that together with um, values holding all of the big picture, an opportunity. And uh, uh, just one example that I hadn't heard about yet today that, that seems exciting to me and connects with municipalities and regions is the notion of zero waste mm -hmm. as bringing into a value that we may be able to unite around and look for practical opportunities for where there's some economic benefit that can, can sometimes be public-private partnerships where you can get win-win. I think about models in California like Urban Ore where um, they, by saving waste cost for the city, brought back um, those, those as jobs and income to the local community. So there are examples out there that, on the ground stuff, uh, looking forward to. Did you have some No, there's another couple yeah. that I haven't spoken. Um, just right there. What strikes me is that we need to look at this from kind of a sustainability perspective. If we just want to wipe out all the big box corporations and start a whole new society, we've just created a whole new mountain of trash that we have to deal with, you know? <laughs> we need to work together and, and to find ways to encourage the Walmarts and the other big corporations of the world to get on board and do what's right for everybody. And having just completed a certificate in sustainability at UMass Dartmouth, I was surprised to find, you know, in, in the studying, that there's a lot of things corporations are doing out there that we on the street don't know about, because it's not making the mainstream news. There's so much information out there that we don't hear on the six o'clock news and isn't in the newspaper and whatever. So I encourage everybody to do some research and to think about how can we all work together for the same goal? How can we convince Walmart, you know, they just built that new place on 140 and they've got windmills, you know? It's so if yeah. we, well, <laughs> maybe, but I think if you look deeper, you might find some people in the corporation of Walmart who really do have their heart in the same place as we do. And they want to do the right things, but like Philip said, they're caught in a structure and aren't we doing ourselves a favor if we help them find a way out of that structure to something new yeah. that we can present to them rather than just hit them over the head and say, you're bad. You know, and, and that's what I was thinking of when, when John was speaking is, you know, we got to be careful not to create more conflict because that takes our energy away from the solution. Anybody else Let's who hasn't work together for a solution. Hi, thank you. My name is Linda. Um, and after listening to everybody, the thing that, that came to me, and Amy, you'll appreciate this, uh, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And I, that's what I've been sort of hearing is, you know, we ask, why do people always vote against their own self-interest? Well, they don't know that's not their self-interest. They've been sold a bill of goods that this is the way it's supposed to be, and if I keep working hard enough, I'll get that too. So I think part of what's missing for me is, is the education part of it. We don't understand. So many people don't understand how the system works. So they just keep buying into it, going and hoping that it will change. So educating on both sides, on the corporate sides, I think of Ray from Interface Carpet. You know, it's like, uh, duh, you know, look, look what's happened. But how long did he go along, you know, destroying the earth until he got that realization? Now, he's a great model for, for you know, OK, an awakening. But there's too many people who are unconscious. So from all different levels, and unless we can really make this clear, we're not going to get there. So I love hearing these ideas, but people are going to go, huh? But that's not the way it works. So that's what I, you know, that's sort of what I'm leaving with. I'm just, I'm just going to, we have six minutes left. I'm just going to read these three questions again. What are areas of the green solidarity economy that the ideas address? 
in the session. Are there ways that the ideas and uh, initiatives addressed in your session can be expanded to include um, other aspects of the solidarity economy? And what are the barriers and areas of convergence? I mean, I'll, obviously, most of what we said feeds into that somehow. But can I just, I just want to say that, you know, obviously, we're talking about very difficult stuff that a lot of people's livelihoods are dependent on capitalism, right, on, on the structure that we have now. So, you know, we're, we're thinking about, like, on a fundamental level, how to transform things so that it works for everybody, it's not just benefiting some people. So, you know, these are, like, I think the language that we use is really important. You know, like, the word capitalism is very scary to some people, you know, because people in government and, in, in, you know, decision-making places in particular, I think. But, you know, obviously, like, you can see there's a, there's a demand for confronting capitalism or, you know, changing it somehow so that it meets all these principles. So maybe just thinking about the language that we use, can we talk about systemic change using terms that aren't, you know, aren't going to scare off the people we need to work with or whatever? No. Um, no. Just um, no. I'm sharing them with the, um, the, the Spruce Project. Um, and obviously we're not going to have all the answers come out of here. So there is a next meeting on the 18th to so like a follow-up to this. Um, also, um, talking about what Amy was talking about, about how we can better work together, Worcester Roots is um, going to be hosting a co-op academy next spring. And I was saying it kind of behooves us to get involved with the workforce training folks that are already in here. You know. So working together around that. Um, the second thing around, the th third thing, is like this, this kind of almost paradigm shift that we have to kind of bring about. Um, I was brought up in a very conservative, very um, hardcore, you know, Reagan is God kind of family when I was younger. And then when I became, you know, became a single mom on welfare and I started getting all these economic literacy trainings, I'm like, hey, this is completely different than what I grew up with. And, and, and um, so I would take all the stuff I'd be learning you know, in economic literacy classes, bringing it back to my family, and they'd be smashing it to hell, and I'd go back, and I'd go, okay, well, how do I fight this? And over 20 years, little baby steps, we have, um, you know, most of the family nests are now post Democrat. <laughs> and they just, I mean, they're, they're wonderful people. They just have different life experiences than I did. They have different ideas on solutions. But, you know, when I went in to talk about education and training for welfare recipients back on Beacon Hill, you know, there are certain people that I don't talk about it that way. I talk about it as an economic development issue. So I think you got to use the different language. One of my job here at Worcester Roots, you know, I go out into the community. Um, I go to the um, events of the Chamber of Commerce. I'm not going to go in there and talk about solidarity economy. No, uh -uh. <laughs> I'll talk about cooperative development and community development. And they all are so supportive of the stuff that we do. It's just, you know, baby steps sometimes. <laughs> Um, so yes. um, <clears throat> yeah, in uh, transitioning like away from the models that we're saying uh, aren't working, a thing that would need to happen is a, a, like a loss of you know some losses on Wall Street, like you know on the stock market, what have you. Like a lot of these companies would have to take a loss. So there needs, to, I, I think, there needs to be some um, you know governmental like imposition on the corporation saying that okay. In order for the actual working solidarity economy to work, you know, we need to redistribute this in some way. So having some like you know grassroots movement um, of people working on some kind of campaign on that level, but also figuring out the ways of filling in the niches that Hill was talking about with like, so you have a supply chain like let's say you have that water bottle right there and it took plastic and aluminum and how do people in a local level have it you know. Have, how could we fill a niche to make these things that are part of this capitalistic system? How do we replace that on the local level and then bring that up to the regional and national level? Um, and not just on the side of production, but having some sort of um, cohesion between the different sectors. Because you know we, we, there are a lot of different initiatives that um, are happening, <coughs> like forwarding the movement of solidarity economy. But they seem fragmented. That there's not one, there's not one entity that's sort of um, 
you know, working on this as a systemic issue while having small local autonomous things. So uh, that's something I'd like to see responding to the third question. I'm afraid we're just about out of time. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a need for this to continue, and hopefully, we don't have to wait till next year for the third conference to, to continue the discussion. A, a big part of the what, what the uh, organizers want to do is think about how this, how we can continue this momentum. You know, we don't just come here and then absorb the stuff and then go back and I mean, say the same. How do we continue to build things? Um, you want to just, just quickly say well, Yeah, I mean, for me, just in relation to question two, the concept that I'm coming away with from this event is the notion of a parallel polis. Yeah. And um, what I like about it is that I think it's a good description of what SAGE has been attempting to do. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been going to those meetings since 2008, and, you know, the size has varied from about 20 down to about five people. We need more people um, to have these kinds of difficult conversations. I really appreciate what, what Joe was saying. And it reminds me of, you know, friends I had who did post-conflict work in Bosnia trying to repair relations between neighbors who fought on opposite sides of the conflict or what happened in South Africa. You know, there are hard conversations that need to be had about what kind of future we want to build. And it reminds me of what uh, Yogi Berra used to say when he would give directions to his house. When you come to the fork of the road, take it. Right? Because <laughs> both ways led to his house. So like, and to me, it's like, let's just hold open the theoretical possibility that we could do both. And, and to my, while recognizing the differences and respecting them, and to me, it's like we have a word for that, and that word is <coughs> solidarity, right? That's why that is front and center uh, in this vision, right? It, it, you know, and it, it means like allowing people to speak without making them on some level synonymous with the words that they're speaking. Like, I'm a, I am a white guy, I'm working class though. I don't represent uh, Evergreen. Um, and I appreciate very much what you said. I, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed that I didn't mention that, that you know, there's a lot to be learned uh, from Evergreen, but you know, by no means is, are they like the answer. I, I, I think this conversation demonstrated to me, we don't have the answers, we do have the questions, but let's not minimize the fact that we have the questions. That's a real sign of progress. This conference so far, totally different than the one we had uh, last year, so much more intense, so much more productive. I'm really enjoying it. Even the hard bits. Can I just say, you know, the, there's an hour for lunch, and if people want to stay, you know, I think there's an event for discussion time. But uh, 